The COVID-19 weekly briefing for June 5th. A look back on the past eight weeks and how these efforts helped get the Poconos through, especially from the healthcare front lines. A perspective from lawmakers and business leaders on the crisis and the road ahead. Plus, how outdoor dining returns to the region this weekend. We'll learn how preserving this moment in history is coming along and revisit the mental health needs of our communities, as well as how the Latino community banded together to help one another through. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us live online and on there for this COVID-19 weekly briefing. I'm Chris Barrett for the COVID-19 briefing team. This program is now in its ninth and final week. Today we will take a retrospective look at the last nine weeks. As we begin this morning, we'd like to first take a look at the numbers. Before you right now is the, in the red line, is the 10 county Nipah region. The blue line is the four county Pocono region, which encompasses the counties of Carbon, Monroe, Wayne, and Pike. And of course, green was the 50 case target line. New cases are on the second slide. And again, our four counties are called out and the 50 case target. As you can see, we're well below the 50 cases. Also, the last 14 days per 100,000 people. Again, when we first started this, this was a metric we started analyzing about eight weeks ago. And our final slide shows the predictive case numbers for the 10 county Nipah region, the four county Pocono region, and of course, the green line is the 50 case target. Again, this information is at PoconoMountains.com slash COVID-19. Our intention in creating this program was to give the communities that we serve in Pike, Wayne, Monroe, and Carbon counties timely, accurate information on COVID-19 in an effort to flatten the curve. That task would have been impossible without the help of Elizabeth Wise and Don Seipel in their roles as leaders of our wonderful health systems. It's so great to have you guys here. It's, Thank it's, it, it's great in some ways. It's our last week. It's, it's sad in others. Um, but when we talked about this and we talked about the wrap, we wanted to just kind of ask some questions about what your reaction was to the last eight or nine weeks. Um, and Elizabeth, I want to start with you. It's, uh, what, how do you think healthcare will change because of the pandemic? So we're really just scratching the surface related to the use of virtual vi video visits and technology. Um, I think that that will continue to evolve. We see a lot of either Gen Xers or millennials using this technology. You know, most people have a smart device or phone that they can tap into. And the other thing that I see happening is an explosion of, I'll call equipment that can be used at home for either monitoring your blood pressure, your temperature, your blood sugar, your weight, your oxygen saturation. I mean, we're really just scratching the surface related to the use of technology. So do you think that the pandemic kind of really started kicking that off? Oh, absolutely. You know, oh. that coupled with, you know, quite honestly, they're reimbursable now. So we see the government quickly reimbursed, started reimbursing vir video visits as well as the commercial payers. And so made it easier for the patients to um, use the technology and uh, avoid the cost. Don, how about you? What do you, how do you see this changing? It yeah, you know, um, Elizabeth and I were talking about this before the show and we, we actually had the same thoughts, you know. And so, yeah, I think the pandemic, when you look at um, what it's done, uh, you talked about change. It really has accelerated change. We probably have jumped three, four, five years in our progress with televisits and, and virtual visits. And, um, you know, the feedback I get now from physicians is that they, uh, it, it's something that they actually have uh, grown to like and likewise with patients and mm -hmm. in some ways they're getting a more quality visit with the patient uh, they seem to open up some patients seem to open up more and um, and I think it's in the right in the right type of visit it, it's a really good use of both their times there's there's still a time and a place to come in and be examined in person but you know, if 25 or 30 percent of the physicians' visits could be done virtually in the future, that's huge. You know, it's a it's a really efficient and cost-effective way to provide health care. So it's interesting the comment that the the uh, patient feels it's more intimate, mm -hmm. e even though it's a video. They feel. 
Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think we'll learn about it as time goes on. I've thought about it, you know, like, you know, maybe it's, a couple of things I've thought of is it's less, maybe it's uh, a more comfortable setting because they're at home. At home, right. Oh, and then, sense, yeah. you know, uh, it's, a, it's a platform or it's a, a way that some people are used to using with friends. So they, they just feel more comfortable communicating. And then maybe just the fact that they're, they're not, even the physician, it's just a more relaxed atmosphere. So it, if other things, too, I think that w I know we've talked about a lot of times, Elizabeth, what surprised you the most over the last day? I, and Don, you too, but what's really surprised you guys, Elizabeth? So a couple things for me. One is speed. The speed at which we had to pivot, adapt, adopt. And I'm not just talking about the healthcare systems in general. I'm talking about the businesses, uh, the community, all right. the changes that we need to make, um, even in healthcare. Our healthcare workers, we had to, we, had, we wrote the book. I mean, we're continuing to write the book as it relates to this pandemic. Um, the innovative technologies, the ways that we're caring for patients are completely different than what we did before. You know, we've talked about some of this on the show, the proning, the type, the convalescent plasma. Um, but I really think it was the speed. And I think the other thing is resiliency. We have a very resilient healthcare community, our community, the fact that, and Don and I have talked about this, the curve was flattened, right? We didn't get overrun as healthcare systems because our community did the things that they needed to do. Well, and I think what impressed me the most is you two were the calming influence throughout the whole community. And I remember talking, anytime we would talk privately, I would say to both of you, I'd say, oh, how are you guys doing? Oh, great. <laughs> you know, so I, said, I said, you guys should be the busiest people in the world. And, and your comment was, no, we're resilient. And I think your calming influence in a really great way just affected all of us. Well, I mean, it, it really, really did. And, and it gave us, you, you explained the information in a way that we could present it, that people understood. And I think they saw that they had a part in this, Don, don't you think, in, in doing the, the curve flattening? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, um you know, this started with a few key business leaders who saw the need and quickly we, you know, we engaged the right, right folks and got the message out. And yeah, this community, you know, since I've been here uh, in Monroe County, this community is awesome. I knew it was. Uh, I think COVID just reinforced that and everyone has done, you know, what we've asked them to do. And, you know, we, we are really in a good place today but we do have to continue to, to practice some of the basic uh, techniques with the masking and the hand washing and the social distancing. And we'll be able to reopen and, and get back to what I keep calling our new normal. Um, and I think those are new programs that we'll all be coming up with in the future. Mm -hmm. But for, for you, Elizabeth, too, and, and I, I wanted to ask this before we went to our package, but how do you see future generations grappling with the pandemic? I mean, because a lot of people brought up the Spanish flu, but no one seemed to have any lessons from it. I mean, I know it was 100 years ago, but. I had two thoughts on that. One is I am reading a book called The Forgotten Pandemic, and it does talk about the Spanish influenza of 1918. And there are many similarities between what happened then and what's happening now. Things like wearing of the mask, washing your hands, very similar. So. I encourage healthcare professionals to read about history so they can learn from it and apply it. And then I was thinking about for non-healthcare professionals that we need to continue to do what we did during this time, right? We all came together. We helped our most vulnerable uh, in our community. Um, we never gave up hope. I talked about hope every week and my hope that I shared with our community. And I think that we need to continue to do this, not only now, but in the future. You know, we have a lot of unrest going on in our country. And um, I think that we need to think about the things that we did to get us through this. And it will continue, you know, like Don said, and we need to continue to come together and support each other. And I hate to, you know, because we're almost at the end of this segment, but Don, mm -hmm. I want to close with you. Same question. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, Elizabeth, right, I, you know, I think, listen to our experts. You know, I think, um, you know, they're the ones that are in the best position to really give us some good advice, uh, even though it's changing. You know, don't distrust them when the recommendations change. They change because we learn more about the virus. And I think overall those things worked well. 
Um, and uh, like Elizabeth said, let's stay together and work together. This is a great community and we support each other. And, um, and, and don't forget, don't lose hope, you know, like Elizabeth talked about it. We can quickly lose our perspective on things with, in situations like this. And, you know, when we stick together, we get through it, we come out of it even stronger and more resilient than when we went into it. Well, I know that hope has a new definition for me after seeing that uh, week after week, and it gave me, and I think a lot of our viewers, a lot of confidence. But let's take a look back. What did the last eight weeks really look like? Good morning, I'm Chris Barrett, and you're watching COVID-19 Weekly Briefings, a resource for Pocono residents. Shortly, we'll be joined by healthcare leaders where you can get up to date information at our website. Now, in our fourth week, now in our fifth week, our sixth week, it's seventh week, it's eighth week. It's just, it's truly wonderful. There, the, everyone you see behind me are the true unsung heroes that go through it every single minute of every single day. Potentially in the virus without even realizing that I've contracted it and I'm wearing gloves. Your conditions aren't taking a break because we're in the midst of a pandemic. The number of infections in the hospital and in our community has gone down in the last couple of weeks, which should make people more comfortable to come back and get treated appropriately. And we were able to get to people really fast, really quick in their homes. And we had educational programs, we had networking programs, we had fun happy hour programs. So honestly, we just found a whole new way to network. Um, and it's not about being their teacher, it's about being their parent. You were their first teacher, um, and you don't have to set a schedule that has gym and lunch and all these things. Your job is to teach them the things that they need to know in order to be prepared for their future. We want Milford to be held to a higher standard. People are ready to open up safely. They wanted to get back, wanted to get started, but wanted to do it the right way. We're excited to be able to offer a one-day giving day online at nipagives.org. We are going to be limiting group sizes, limiting transitions. Depending on what hand we're dealt, are you looking to send your child back to school? And if you are, Great, you know, we will have a plan for that. I mean, of course there's issues with it, anything with a new, you know, with a new system, but I have also heard some success stories that people are starting to get unemployment compensation through through this PUA. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Pinterest, we're seeing all of these, these moms doing these, you know, amazing meals and they're putting together these craft projects for their kids and, and some of us are just barely holding it together while we've taken on additional roles. Those leaders and partners within our community, along with all of you, have a great role in flattening the curve and getting us back to recovery. The virus not only attacked our health, it did and well still has, shaken our lives in many unthinkable ways that would have been unthinkable just a few weeks ago. Some of us had to make sense of it, especially those in the human services sector, as well as those representing thousands of our businesses. Marlon Kistner of the Pocono Mountains Chamber and Sarah Jacoby of the Pocono United Way are with us right now. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here today. We've talked a lot in the last eight weeks, and um, we know that this is something that's gonna continue for all of us, but we, and, and it's ongoing. And, but, but, but first, Sarah, I wanted to ask you, it seems that accessibility to food especially over the last few weeks, seems to be more of a problem. Why is that? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. So we at United Way really try to keep our finger on the pulse of the needs in our community. And what we're seeing with regard to food is really two separate trends. One is we've seen an increase in the number of families that are using a food pantry, in some cases for the first time. And th these people are really, um, you know, folks that have been destabilized by this crisis. They've either lost their job or they've had a reduction in hours. They've had to close their business. So they're in need of help some, in some cases for the first time. 
That number fortunately is starting to stabilize. We're really glad to see that. The food pantry system in our community has done a tremendous job making sure that no one is going hungry. But the second trend that we're seeing is that there are also people who had been using food pantries who now need to use them more often. So whereas somebody might, might have been able to get by with one visit per month to the food pantry, now they need to come multiple times because they've just been that much more destabilized. They're either waiting on an unemployment check to come through, waiting on the stimulus payment, um, and so they're in need of a little extra help. But we always encourage everyone, please do not let pride stand in the way of right. getting the help your family needs. There is help available. Our food pantry system stands ready to serve you and your family. And so for more information, people can go to PoconoHunger.org slash find food. So you're saying basically, Sarah, there's no reason for anyone in our community to go hungry. I mean, you guys are doing yeoman's work with that. And, and do, you, how do, you, do you see this rolling out further as, a, a, into the next maybe three to six months? Yeah, yeah, we know that this is going to be a long, long process of recovery for our community. And we, from day one, have been focused on moving from relief to resilience in our community. That's really been important for us to keep our eye on the ball. It's not just about providing Band-Aid type solutions, although we are ready to provide people with the help they need today. We also have our eye on tomorrow. Tomorrow. Well, speaking of today and tomorrow, Marlon Kistner, I have to ask you um, so much. We're hearing so much about PPP. How have our been at businesses, because you're handling the carbon uh, county market, you're handling our Pocono market, you're assisting with, with uh, the, our other counties, and of course the Lehigh Valley, Lehigh County, Northampton. How is, um, how is PPP affected? Why do we hear so much about it? Is it a good thing? It is, Chris. I think in the beginning, as we all knew, this happened so fast and it came out so fast. The information uh, was really distributed so quickly that the chamber really had to figure out how are we gonna be able to help our businesses navigate this. We would get calls saying, Marlon, I don't even know what b button to press first, or who do I call, or where do I go to just get this funding? So we did a lot of that navigation in the beginning, a lot of that support in the beginning, and I can tell you, just even the past week, people are getting the funding, they're figuring out how to use the funding, and we're making sure through the chamber, if they don't, uh, we have people that are helping them navigate that. So, so for our folks who wouldn't know, what does PPP mean? It is the protection uh, payment plan, basically. And uh, that is going to be for businesses who are able to use this funding through uh, this program to really help with everything from bringing their employees back uh, to really some of the utilities, anything that really they need to help protect their business right now and to get that funding now so that they can pay it back later or even some of that funding can be forgiven, which I think is really crucial. Uh, but it's, it's needed to keep the lights on and to get them back. So y you folks have done a lot of programs that have, are not related to that, mm -hmm. the small business grant program. Uh, how many bit small businesses does that help? That, that's a great story. We were so, so blessed to be able to do that with funders, the Chamber of Commerce in the Lehigh Valley, BB&T Bank, Jandal Farms, just to name a few. Out of the gate, we had $300,000 that we were able to give to small businesses in increments of $1,000 and in increments of $1,500. And in some cases, that was how they survived the month, right? It, it was, and what we were hearing is it was such a shock that they had to close their doors, Chris. They could not do business, and all of a sudden, this is, was their livelihood. So to be able to give them the $1,000, help them with two payments of rent, or it helped pay an employee, or it helped even keep the lights on yeah. with utilities. And so we were so proud to be able to help over 300 businesses so that when that PPP funding did come in, they had a little bit of that grant funding that, guess what, you don't have to pay this back. You know, this is given to you by the chamber uh, because of the great partners that we have. And it was amazing. Wow. That's, that's, that's a, that was great because I know the thing that really stood out to me was how many of those businesses you said couldn't keep the lights on. Yes. And they wouldn't have survived even to this point now that we're yellow and green. And I, I want to come back to you on the yellow and green because that, I, I think there's, it's interesting to see how that's going to roll out as, you know, within the next week or two. Um, but I want to just turn to you, Sarah, really quickly is, you, you, the United Way adapted so quickly, just as the chambers did for the business community. Um, how do you see the needs changing in the next three to six months? Because I think people think once we go to yellow and green, it's over. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not the case, really, is it? 
Yeah, it's not the case. Uh, we know that even before this crisis happened, two out of every five households in Monroe County was struggling to get by. They were living paycheck to paycheck, and that has not changed, um, even as we start to move into green and as we start to recover from this. You know, United Way has been in our community for over 75 years, and really what we do is we mobilize resources where they're needed most. So we're going to continue to do that. But in the next three to six months, what you're going to see from your local United Way here is an increasing focus on poverty, racism and trauma and how those things come together to affect people's lives. What we're really looking to do, as I said earlier, is build resilience in our community uh, so that the next time we have a crisis or the next time we have a setback, we're all better off. So not only did we have a pandemic, we had other things happening at the same time. I um, mean, you guys have really always been at the forefront of um, keeping the community where it needs to be. And Michael Takeev is a great leader. and We've had him here a few times and, and appreciate his leadership, but you're there too helping and um, we've learned so much about the food needs and it's good to hear that there's someone there sustaining that. But I want to move back to as we, cl as we, we get close to closing, Marlon, because your crystal ball, because I just asked Sarah for the next three to six months for businesses, small businesses, now that we're, we're getting close to green. So what is that? What do you think that looks like? We are. And I can tell you through all of this, Chris, and I heard this word many times, the resilience of our businesses. When this hit, we had businesses that are already thinking, how am I going to survive while this is happening? And how am I going to survive in the green stage when we can get back to that semi-normal? So we know a lot of our restaurants have been closed, our barber shops, our spas, our hairdressers. Like These are folks that have not been able to do business for weeks and weeks. And so really, these are the ones that once we get into that green stage, we've got a kickstart. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking everyone, please support local. Get out there, get your hair cut, get your hair done again. Uh, make sure that you're going out to eat, you're dining out. What a great day today, we can dine out. How exciting is that? So I just ask, please, please, anybody listening, shop local, support local. We need to kickstart this economy like crazy. And you know what, Chris? It is still a crystal ball. We don't know where it's going to be. But guess what? Week to week, we are figuring it out. We're helping, we're connecting our businesses with the great leaders that we have in this community. Um, and I have a really cool story. I had a guy who did receive the PPP funding, one of our members, and he called me and he said, Marlon, I want to give back. Where's the local food bank? So I call Mike wow, Takiva. So that's where you just see all of a sudden he's back and he's giving back. So it's how we stay connected for sure. And it's great about the collaboration. I think one of the great things is that so many folks from our community came together yes. in all four counties in the last eight weeks. Mm -hmm. and. You know, we're, we want to try to make sure that we continue that. But I want to thank both of you for being here today. You've been such a great part of this for all of us, and we really, really appreciate it. As we move closer to the green face for our four counties, restaurants are able, speaking of restaurants, are able to welcome back diners starting today. But for outside dining only, Jim Hamill with the Pocono Television Network tells us more. Outdoor dining is back at Glass Wine Bar, the restaurant at Ledges Hotel, overlooking this gorgeous view in Holly. There is a big weight off of our shoulders of being able to welcome um, dining customers back. It's, a, it's just in time for the majority of the summer season. The decks and dining areas may have fewer tables and chairs, but that's by design to offer the most comfortable experience for people who want to have dinner served to them somewhere other than home. Everyone wants to look at the waterfalls, and who wouldn't? So we've taken these glass dividers and repurposed them from heat walls and from keeping moisture out for weather to essentially become clear and see-through booths where you can feel like you're out in the open space, uh, but at the same time you're safe and protected from any kind of interaction with other people um, and be waterfall front frontage at the same time. All three of the restaurants near Lake Wallenpapak and Settlers Hospitality Group have redefined dining with plenty of outdoor setups like the ones here at Glass. There's even a private spot for one party per night. Reservations are always, always recommended and especially right now. What we've done is we've created some outdoor um, private dining which really only has one table per night in that space and that's for people who just want to be left alone and with a small group. Dining out in the Pocono Mountains is now more than ever a fresh air experience, whether it's next to the water or on the wiffle ball field. Barley Creek Brewing Company in Tannersville has transformed its pint-sized park to let diners step up to a different sort of plate. And we're going to put tables out onto our wiffle ball field, and we're going to put tables out near um, you know, some of the other places. 
um, and socially distanced um, properly. And we're still going to have some fun with a great view of a big Pocono. Barley Creek has four acres outside its facility to set up for outdoor dining, while its indoor dining is on hold until the state gives the go-ahead. This operation continues to offer takeout and soon a whole new experience for anyone who likes to mix camping with going out to eat. The Samore dining area is um, a little bit of a campsite um, outdoor dining area that we're going to go ahead and um, make it private um, dining campsites. And, um, and you know, you can go ahead and uh, at the end of dinner um, cook your s'mores. And when the weather threatens, Barley Creek is prepared to put up tents for cover all in an effort to do what it takes to make this a safe, enjoyable option for patrons. As the rules and regulations um, um, relax and as, uh, as the summer progresses and the COVID numbers go down, we're going to be able to go out and, and, and play cornhole. We're going to go ahead and play wiffle ball, um, bocce ball, and pickleball. And so, yeah, the fun is, the fun is just beginning this weekend. This weekend is also the start of outdoor dining at one of the storied Pocono Resorts, Skytop Lodge. We get a lot of participation. A lot of people eat outside during the summer here, uh, especially in this area here and up on the south lawn right off the, uh, the lodge. I'm going to say probably everybody enjoys at least one meal um, outdoors here at Skytop. Now that public health measures are first and foremost for places like Skytop, the resort has spread out tables on these spectacularly green grounds. We have these tables here. We'll have tables over here in our other patio. We've already placed picnic tables out in our south lawn outside the main lodge. Uh, everything is at least six plus feet apart. And the view? Well, it's hard to find this from any indoor setting anyway. Here you can see the lake behind us. You get a nice view of the ridge and the mountains up in the other area. So if it's a view you're looking for, along with some great cuisine and a safely designed dining experience, these restaurants across the Pocono Mountains are ready for you. Jim Hamill for the Pocono Television Network. Leadership has many faces. Our communities are well served by officials at the county and local level. This senator and representative fight for the Poconos every day at the state level. Representative Rosemary G Brown and Senator Marius Cavello, two of my most favorite people in the world. <laughs> they fought the fight the last eight weeks in many, many ways. And we could go on for hours, but we only have eight minutes, which is sad. <laughs> <laughs> so Not much, much time. Nah. <laughs> but you, you guys have been amazing. And um, just like I think our health systems were rocks for us, you two, at, f from a leadership perspective on the state level, were rocks. Anytime we needed you, you were right there. Um, so I'm s we're so happy to have you here today to, to just talk a little bit about um, uh, what's been happening in the last eight weeks and where you see the future. But one of the things I wanted to, I'm going to start with you, Senator. What, what, do you, what legislative changes do you think we'll see because of the pandemic on the horizon? First thing, without even, um, I can tell you that uh, the governor would never get that uh, emergency declaration the way he did. Um, you, you have to put, um, you, you can't be uh, a dictator. You have to bring House Republicans, House Democrats, uh, Senate uh, Democrats, Senate Republicans, the leaders, and get together and discuss what you're going to be doing and why you're doing it. Don't just go in front of a TV screen and then everybody finds out at that point. There's too, there were too many surprises. Um, the one thing that, um, and th this is what I've seen, the unemployment issue in our state is number one in the country. We have states with three times our population with less unemployment. So what we did was we kept businesses closed and on the other side, we hired 200 people to, to take care of unemployment. And half of them left already because they, they just, it just doesn't work. We need to, we, we need to uh, do a better thinking with what the businesses that you're going to decide that are not, uh, not big. I understand the essentials, but some of the non-essentials that don't, uh, like a car dealer, for example, why couldn't a car dealer or a realtor have worked during that period of time? You know, realistically, we got two million people. I would say the unemployment should have been about 1.2 with our population. And if we were at 1.2, I can tell you, we won't have a $5 billion shortfall. That shortfall would probably be in the area about $3 billion. If we don't open up this uh, economy soon, totally open it up, we're looking in um, probably about an eight or nine billion dollar shortfall. 
Well, Ro Rosemary, I, how about what do you think about legislative change as yeah. it as we go forward? Yeah, I think some of that with the um, the powers that the legislator legislative body had given to the executive um, level, you know, that was given back in the 1970s. So you know that was supposed to be a 90 days temporary i think you'll see some some work towards that to more of a balanced of you know the checks and balances between the different uh, legislative body and the executive branch because when you have the voices taken away of your legislators you really take away the voice of the people and so as we work and as we work during this crisis you would hear what people wanted and you know you go by the majority obviously you're not going to have everybody on your side for everything but um, your voice to then you know that process is very important for the people so i think that balance is important i mean it was a it was a crisis so the executive order uh, emergency powers in the beginning was very important to react very quick but then you have to you have to blend it at a certain point but i do think a lot of the policies are going to be determined on the behaviors of our society, of our businesses, you know, how much telework continues, how much driving is reduced. Um, I was in a transportation meeting yesterday, and you look at the Turnpike Commission, you look at these things where the patterns of driving are down 47%, yeah, and the toll wow. collections are down. So you look at the financial impacts, but how is our society going to behave in the future that will be permanent? rather than temporary. Um, and one of the, you know, that's why we did a temporary budget because there are so many unknowns. So I think you really have to look, and we're gonna have to look at policies that reflect some of that and for our, our budgeting as well. But, um, you know, it's very critical that we, we, we use this information that we have to prepare so that if this was ever to happen again, or even a second wave, we know how to implement and, and work fast. What I think I should say is both of you, your staffs were just amazing. Yeah. We had Christine and McKenzie in, and, and they talked about the help that you've given thousands of Pennsylvanians who just had basic questions, some who were never in the system before. Yeah. Um, and it, the system was just completely overwhelmed, like immediately. And it was tragic, but I mean, I know you guys are still feeling, fielding those calls right now, and it's, it's gotta yeah. be tough. But one question I wanted to ask kind of as a final here is, um, it seemed like the senior living homes were really the problem. Um, and I, I want to turn to you, Mara, and then to you, Rosemary, finally. Do you see reform there? I mean, what do you oh see? Oh, my gosh, yes. See? We definitely. But I'm going to tell you, um, I called the governor's office about three months ago. In Italy, on one day, 400 seniors passed. And I said to the chief of staff, I said to the legislative director, close down the nursing homes to visitors and test the employees going in. If they had done that, that five, that you can take 3,000 people off the, the, off the rolls of the, of the COVID deaths, of COVID-19 deaths, because the, the nursing homes are 68 to 70 percent of, of, the, of the deaths, wow. you know? That, they could have been eliminated. Now I'm going to mention this because one nursing home in this county did that. Check the employees going in and did not allow visitors, and that's Mrs. Bush. Not one COVID-19 patient in that building. Wow, I didn't know that. And that's it's good. not a small, it's not a small, so yeah, have we learned? Yes, because we could have saved many lives. And that's the goal, we, ha we have to go in that direction. And, um, uh, and I think that nursing homes need to get some more help because it can't be all about the dollar. You're taking care of seniors, right. and I think the government needs to look at that very closely. You can't cut corners when you're dealing with seniors. And Rosemary, finally to you. Yeah, the most vulnerable population, as we've learned from the science with this, with this crisis. So, you know, on a state average, uh, as Mario said, you know, 68% on an average for the state was the seniors for our death rate. Um, now, in our county, we were much lower than that. We didn't equate to that percentage. However, on a statewide average, it was 68%. But we did pass bipartisan legislation that was signed by the governor, which creates a uh, regional health collaboration. And uh, it takes the state and it puts it into six different zones. And the Department of Human Services, um, it's a private-public partnership which is really great and it works with our medical institutions in those six regions of the state and they're focused on our senior living, our assisted living and our personal care homes and it really puts the prevention, the um, testing, everything into the hands of medical professionals 
who really know exactly what they're doing with this population and with the nurse, you know, the, the older residents. And so that's a really great initiative that I think is put into place that will really help us as we move forward with a, a situation that I think could have been handled better. Wow, that was that's great information, yeah. and, and I, I hope everybody heard that because that's great change, that's yeah. great reform, and it's collaboration. It's and I'm really fortunate because I get to see these folks all the time and talk to them and know the great job that they do, the great job that you guys did in, in leadership in the last eight months. It's, and I know, or excuse me, it better not be eight months, eight weeks. Um, <laughs> oh, no. You guys did young. It felt like it. <laughs> it did, <laughs> it's right. It still feels like right. <laughs> but you both did an amazing job, and thank you so much for your leadership yeah. and everything that you continue to do. Thank you for what you've done. Chris, I want to thank you yeah. for what you've done. These programs yeah, and you. keeping people aware of what's going on and that. That's so important, and uh, you stepped to the plate, and uh, I really applaud you and and the um, and oh, thank you. Pulled a lot of people together. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. COVID nineteen has drastically changed our everyday lives, but the pandemic is also a historic event. An area organization is thinking toward the future and working to document the global crisis on a local level by looking at the past. Brianna Strong takes a look. Wonderful. They're all on hikes. They're all running and. Um, <laughs> exciting to see. These East Stroudsburg Area School District educators gave students a unique assignment to document their personal experiences during the pandemic. They took it and ran with it and really the rest is truly history. The Ruiz brothers wrote a book detailing life at home during quarantine. Their family tackled household projects, played board games, made meals together, even had karaoke nights. Other students put their creative talents to work, making inspirational signs for their teachers, even photographing a day outdoors. I think in particular, seeing the submissions from the students, they're removed from social media. You know, we're seeing the kids engaging more with nature, you know, engaging more with their families, engaging more with individuals. It's all part of a special project put on by the Monroe County Historical Association. The nonprofit is collecting digital and physical content from Monroe County residents to document the community's response to COVID-19. As we, uh, we look back, we can find the data and the numbers and all of those things about the coronavirus. But how did it impact Monroe County citizens? You know, what did we do? How did we come together to triumph? And, and that's really what we wanted to document. <laughs> The Historical Association received this video showing how East Stroudsburg University used a 3D printer to manufacture face shields for hospital staff. Other artifacts include hand sanitizer bottles produced by local distilleries, a kid's comic book strip, and photos showing the current state of the world. So it's a really great representation from across the county. The Historical Association doesn't have much information about how the Spanish flu of 1918 impacted Monroe County residents. So documenting this major pandemic is important. Our job is to move our stories forward. And we're here to tell your stories. And that's what we wanna do. We wanna preserve them and share them for future generations. So far, the East Stroudsburg Area School District has helped collect 200 submissions from 45 different families. So projects like this are really important for us to always remember that we're not only one district, but we're part of a larger um, ecosystem of our community also. These senior yard signs have replaced traditional graduation ceremonies. It's a sign of the times, historic times, now well documented for all. For Pocono Television Network, I'm Brianna Strunk. We would now like to take a look at a topic that has been there all along during this crisis, the mental health of everyone. Because COVID-19 has affected us all in some way or another, we have spent a couple of briefings with the topic. And as we look forward to getting back into our communities and interacting with others more often, we're thankful to have some experts right with us here to share their thoughts. Three of the panelists have been here before. Jessica Hopton, a clinical coordinator at Lehigh Valley Health is joining us for the first time. So there's Jessica, welcome everyone. Doctor, 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 I made that really, really easy. <laughs> Thank you for having us. <laughs> These guys have been great. And this was a topic that we really kind of needed to spend some time on and we didn't spend enough on. Um, so really the one thing I want to do, I think I, I want to go to you uh, first, uh, Dr. Um, Canari. <laughs> There's three doctors here, I have to define which one. 
Um, in, a, in a recent KFF poll, nearly half, 45% of adults in the United States, reported that their mental health has been negatively impacted due to worry and stress over the virus. Does that surprise you at all? No, it really doesn't because um, obviously this has been such a drastic change for so many people. Um, and, you know, one of the most uh, important things for human beings is uh, predictability. And there has been so much unpredictability. And um, predict unpredictability translates into anxiety because if you don't know what's coming next, it's worrisome, obviously. Um, and uh, there's lots of studies that show that, you know, uh, stress levels go up, biochemical levels go up in, in people who are put into situations that are unpredictable. Um, and certainly this has been a very trying time, so that does not surprise me in the least. Pat, I want to ask you a question. Does that surprise you, that statistic at all? Because I know you've been counseling, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, the whole it, time. It does surprise me, actually. I think it's uh, a little low. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. Uh, as Dr. Canari said, had mentioned, we, uh, we, when we encounter any kind of change, and we're seeing change all the time. We saw change when we went into this thing. We're going to see change coming out of this thing. Um, but any kind of change puts stress on our minds and on our bodies and our daily routines, uh, which, which can be quite challenging. So any stress can uh, blow back into mental health issues, albeit it could be minor signs of depression, it could be major signs of depression, social, social withdrawal, uh, you name it. So I, I, one of the things that, that I've kind of wondered is, I'm sorry, this isn't a question, I'm gonna throw it to Paul. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I know you will. But, one of the things I've often wondered is now that we've gone from yellow, we're st they're starting to talk about green possibly coming up. Paul, do you see anybody saying, oh, there's a little light at the end of the tunnel now? Is it helping even a little bit? I think so. You know, Dr. Kanani is right on point where she's talking about predictability. And these leads give us predictability, just like your script gives us predictability about where we're going to go a little bit, but sometimes right. you, get, you get sidetracked. You know, a lot of this is about um, how quickly do we adapt and, and adjust to a new normal, you know, a term we're all talking about, a new normal. Um, and if it's a small habit, I think that we, we generally, if you're intentional about it, you adapt within about two months. And we're about at that point. You know, so two months ago, you know, um, I forgot my mask everywhere I went. And now two months in, it's right here. And there's one in my car, and there's one in my home by my keys. And there's, so I've adapted for a very small habit. For a large habit, my whole life, our whole lives, in our communities, everywhere we go, every store, it may take a year or two to make that change. So I think that what you're going to see is the smaller things we've all started to make the adaptations to. And so hopefully that'll translate into a little bit less anxiety, a little bit less of the spikes in the mental health problems. But long term, this, this is going to take a year or two because we have to cycle through um, everything in our lives once or twice to, to really get used to it. So, you know, Father's Day is coming up in a couple of weeks, and, and, and I host a family event for that, and so we're trying to work through how can, that, how can we operationalize that, doing social distancing with the age of my family members and other things. Um, and I need to go through that this summer. We need to get through the fall, the winter, the spring, and then maybe again. So somewhere between a year or two, I think, we'll start to see that we've all, as a culture, maybe as a globe, started to adapt and, and see positive results out of this. You brought to, um, this something very interesting, the mask, because the health systems have always told us uh, that the mask, everything is important, but the mask is one of the most important things mm -hmm. that someone can do. So you're saying that from a behavioral standpoint, maybe people are more accepting of that now. Do you feel that, doctor? Maybe in? Well, I don't think, um, I think it's just a reality. I think that, um, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's a choice at the moment uh, from a health perspective. Um, we know that this is something that we must absolutely do. And, um, and I don't think you should make it a choice at this point. I think it's a reality. I think that it has to be part of what your daily routine really is. So, um, you know, from, from the perspective of we want to move forward safely, please don't don't develop um, uh, habits or, or, or routines that ca are counterproductive either. And that's, that's a challenge, right? That's putting stress on people. 
but I do think that for, um, for, for the greater good and uh, to move forward safely, we are going to have to see that some of this is, um, is not a choice and we have to abandon our idea of what we feel we should be able to do. There, there is going to be some restriction. And um, if you're having trouble with that, then talk about it. You talk know, about it. Problem solve it. Right. Troubleshoot it. How but can I make it worse? Don't keep it inside. Yeah. I mean, angst will, will make it worse. So Jessica, new normal, right? That's, <laughs> so we're going to put that one all on you. So everybody here talked about the new normal. Um, how do you, how, when, you, when, when you talk to your patients and they ask you that question, what does that mean? What is your first reaction to that? I mean, I think one of the biggest things I've noticed seeing patients is really that we are all in this together. Um, patients typically come in and see a therapist or a doctor sort of looking for direction or um, advice or, you know, for them to kind of have some of the answers or at least the guidance to get patients to where they want to be. In this, we're kind of all at the same place. Um, a lot of the therapy sessions recently are really just kind of processing with patients where we're at. Um, everybody's had a different journey. Um, I think in sort of seeing the new normal, it's really people adapting to all of these things, the masks, um, graduations, you know, that's a huge thing that people have missed out on, parents, students, right. um, and that can be high school, college, even kids, that is their last day of kindergarten. Parents are sad that they didn't get to see their kid graduate from kindergarten. Um, but, you know, trying to make the best out of those things and celebrating when we can, um, you know, doing, doing the things that we can do to celebrate those things. It doesn't have to be all negative. It can very much be, um, you know, positive celebration. And, and in some ways, it's, it's kind of cool that they get to say, hey, I graduated during the pandemic when all this craziness was going on. I mean, that's yeah, going to be a great it. story one day to tell their kids. Um, and I, I think it's helped people reset on really prioritizing what it is that's important. Um, you know, I think this process of getting to the new normal has really been a grieving process. Um, it, not everybody has gone through every single step of grieving, but at some point, you know, it's denial, it's, it's negotiating, it's anger, and people are getting to the place of acceptance at, at, different, at different times. Um, but the hope is that everybody gets to that place of acceptance where we can kind of embrace this and, and say, this is life, you know, this is, this is where we're at and there's nothing we're gonna do to be able to go back and, and live how we used to live before all this. That's, that's interesting and, and you two folks are practitioners, you're academics and practitioners. Um, Pat, do you think that this will change the way stu when students are coming in, they, they, they wanna be psychologists, they wanna be psychiatrists, they wanna be counselors, how will this change in the academic setting, the way you teach this process, will it change that at all? Mm, absolutely. Um, psychology is one of the, the cool fields, and this is one of the, the draws it had for me, is it's involved in every aspect of our lives, and it's constantly evolving and changing. And looking at the, the situation with the COVID and how we responded to it, we're sitting on a, a mountain of data and, and uh, information about people and how they adapted, not only at, at a sociological perspective, but as individuals as well. So um, that's gonna be a new field that's coming up. How do we respond to crises like this? And I, I think uh, we're gonna see a lot of positive interactions with students because they're gonna be able to relate to this. We've had about a 20 year generational gap um, between the last time we've really experienced any kind of uh, turbulence, at least in, in on North American soil. Um, so this is gonna be a game changer for us. And I, I think a lot, of, a lot of our students are gonna be able to relate to um, crises and, and how we handle them. This is, I, I know we could go on a, for a long time. That's why I wanted to have you guys back, but Paul, I gotta end this somewhere. I wanna end it with you. Um, the, the first time you were in, you, you brought with you a lot of real strong coping processes and methods that were kind of interesting. But the same question to Pat, how do you see this affecting students going forward? I mean, as far as how they'll learn your craft and profession? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, with my beginning counseling students, you know, the, that I teach, one of the things we do is about body language, and it starts with a handshake in North America. So you just think about that. It's not just the mask. You know, the, the pressure I was teaching students, the pressure of a handshake, the approach to the other person, the person's body language, all those tell you something about someone. Now, what do you do now? That was interesting. What do you do now? Don and I were just talking about that with Elizabeth before we went on air, and I, and I said, I actually like to shake people's hands yeah. because you feel that connection sure. and commitment. So how, what happens this is that? This is a challenge because, you know, um, adapting to a new behavior like this, we're just adding something. 
replacing a behavior that you've been doing for 50 years much different. You, you know, what am I going to replace that with? Am I going to put my hand over my heart? Am I going to touch your elbow? Right. And I, you yeah. know, all and and people want that physical touch, although this seems kind of awkward. At least, <laughs> you know, there are um, and just yesterday, my brother-in-law came over, and you know, immediately I was, I was, I was ready to kind of shake his hand, and so was he, and we were like, oh no. You know, so with those deeply ingrained emotional connections, the people in our lives, we still have to make those changes. So it's about intentionality. You need to be thinking about this at the forefront of what you're doing for the tiniest things, for my students as well. And maybe we'll create uh, the new narrative about how counseling will take place and how human interactions will happen. Um, and we'll develop that as a culture for sure. And we'll come to some acceptable standards like many cultures have done around the world in different ways. Well, this is a very interesting topic, but we, get, but we have to leave it there. I'm so sorry, guys but, and ladies. Thank you so much for coming. It was great to have you, and, and hopefully we'll explore this topic in the future. So thank you so much. We have one more discussion before we close the program. First, we want to urge our communities made up of businesses and organizations, as well as families and hard workers to continue to work together to return to some form of normalcy. The next weeks and months, we'll see many signs that we're getting back to business, but with an emphasis on making sure we keep the health of everyone at the forefront. That's why we created the Pocono Promise. Roughly 300 businesses have signed on to this set of guidelines and best practices. Please tell your neighbor or friend, the people you do business with, that the Pocono Promise is a way to guide us into the clear again. Jim Hamill takes a look. Diversity makes us all stronger. My next guest continually remind me that our world is a wonderful mix of differences. Welcome to our friends, Dr. Damri Bonilla and Christina Luna. Um, you guys are, uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, we just met very recently and, and, and we're looking so much forward to doing things with you folks in the future because diversity is incredibly important for all of us and um, you guys are constantly a great source for me, you know, mm -hmm. to find out what's going on in the rest of the world. I've just learned so much from, from our short friendship, and, and, and I really, really appreciate it. But we wanted to have you in. We couldn't have this final program without you. Um, we wanted to ask a few questions of you. Um, the pandemic, how has Lat the Latino community viewed this? Because family is so important to you folks. So I'm going to ask you first, Christina. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, the pandemic has been hard for everybody, but for the Latino community uh, also it's been very hard because I, coming here, one of our Hispanic uh, community, people that live here was telling me, you know what, it's really hard because we are essential workers, many of us. So we cannot stay home, we have to go out, we're risking our lives, we're risking the lives of our families. Uh, many of them live with their, gra their parents, their grandparents. Uh, Latinos live together, many of them live with their grandparents, their parents, their kids. So, you know, there are people that are putting at risk. So it's really hard for them. And it's been a very stressful time. Some of them cannot, it's also stressful because we like to be together. Uh, we are in contact constantly and suddenly you cannot visit your daughter or your, you know, your parents for a month or for two months, or you have to take trips to New York where they live and help them do their shopping and then go back, you know, right. and then be in quarantine because of that. So it's been really hard because the Latino culture is so family-based. Um, 
Say, say, how do you feel about it? Sure, I, I agree with everything that Christina said. We talk about this often because of the work that we do in the community and the partnership that we have, and we appreciate the new partnership with your organization as well. One issue that we're finding in addition to the family dynamic shifting is that uh, there is workplace discrimination that the community is facing as well. And so the ad additional stress from dealing with changing family dynamics, being essential workers because you don't have the luxury to work from home. I work from home and, and I say I'm blessed to have that luxury. It really right. is a luxury. Um, and then in addition, facing workplace discrimination. So um, we, we find that there is a heightened level of sensitivity and need. Um, and we've had to advocate for and every week we talk about how can we best support the community to understand what are their rights, um, w what are you doing to adjust, how are we supporting them in the use of technology and Zoom. So many of right. us in the American culture have automatically transitioned to using technology and Zoom is a go-to and Google Meets and um, all of these other opportunities that we have. But when you have a language barrier, when you have educational barriers, when you have, um, you don't have internet and or you just don't know how to use things, there are the additional stressors to just the everyday communication and connection that Christina is referring to and I think I you know not to shift gears too much but time is I would love to be here all day with all of you but I, I, I have to ask George George Floyd's tragic death um, I, I want to ask you first Christina and then go back to you doctor how, how, how do you how do you reconcile that how, how do you feel about it it's, it's, it's really hard, but first I want you to understand that the Hispanic communities are of different colors. Maybe that be look like she has one skin, light skin color, I'm darker, there's some that Which are. I never knew until, you know, you guys educated me on that. I yeah. never knew that. You always think that Latinos look a certain way, right? But we are all, we, we are used to being with multicolors, multiracials because we live together and we grew up together. Hispanics can be black, white, uh, olive color skin. So we're used to that and we, we, we don't see the separation that other people might see. So I think that it's a great opportunity for the Hispanic community to also educate all the other communities that we are together, that we live together and we are the same. And this is a, like a problem now because some of the people have brought their concerns to us. They're afraid of, you know, like uh, sending their kids out you know, like if, they, if they're not white, they're afraid of the consequences of, or, you know, what if my kid doesn't come home? What if mm. somebody, you know, like, you know, uh, hurts him or attacks them? So that's a big concern, but I think it's also an opportunity to integrate the different racials in the community. So we have about 30 seconds. I hate yeah, to do that. Uh, well, I want to piggyback and say that one, we need a follow-up discussion. It's important and we have a responsibility as leaders in the community to have the discussion. Um, there are over 20 subgroups represented in that Latino space umbrella and part wow. of it is really educating our community, empowering people to understand why they should be civically engaged. I'm doing a talk tonight on Instagram Live at 8 p.m. around what is civic engagement and how can you get civically engaged because we have to empower our community to be able to talk about the issues, shed light on systemic racism and oppression, and how does that relate to the different community issues that are very critical when it comes to education, when it comes to um, political representation, when it comes to just existing, and that's really the base of the conversation that we have not had across the board in society, but even particularly here in, in the Poconos region. I mean, I'm representing the governor here for the third year now, but we hadn't had representation in over a decade that we can't not have representation and we can't not have discussions and 30 seconds for this kind of deep discussion mm. is not okay. So we need to create the spaces and the platforms to be able to do that. And we do and, I, and one of the things we wanna do is we hope to continue this program um, in the future. So we wanna bring you Great. guys back for a longer segment because there's so much there um, that we just can't leave. We gotta really talk about it. I think yeah. the civic engagement piece is incredibly important. I know myself, I was happy to see you know, the, the civil um, peaceful protesting because I think we need that right. we need to know and lift up everybody we need to lift up diversity and um, I'm grateful to have met you guys and look forward to our partnership moving forward too. Thank okay. you and your own family history and the issues that you've shared from your your grandmother and your family I think is an important lens and and the more we talk about things we realize that there are differences but there are also a lot of similarities and we're able to come together to talk about them so look forward to that. We certainly do. Thank you guys so thank much. You, you can stay right here. Thank you. Um, as we close this briefing today, we need to thank many people. 
nothing can be done without the support and collaboration of the talent of great people. ESU, BRC 13, Zach Booth, and our studio staff made this happen every week. James Hamill and Brianna Strunk told the stories as they do so well. Nine weeks ago, a group of disparate community leaders came together with a mission to save their community from a terrible, quick-moving virus that no one seemed to understand. They had a signalness of mind and purpose. They put their own interests aside and provided their resources without reservation. As this unfolded, our community teetered on the shock of sickness and flirted with anarchy as our store shelves emptied. Our unflappable health systems educated us. They told us that all of us were the solution. We had thought that a mask was an accoutrement of skullduggery or a mere party favor. How could it save our lives? What was social distancing? Weren't we all social creatures? We, we just heard it now. Would we quarantine? The answer was yes. All of us heeded the counsel of our health systems and our state leaders. We followed the governor's orders. We colored between the lines. That is the reason why we brought the virus to heal. What makes the Poconos a special place? It's natural beauty, certainly. But its real secret is its people. They have grit and determination. We saw that in the last eight weeks. And they care. A great deal of good has come from this adversity. The Poconos is on that path. When we started the program, my first comment was that I would be the happiest person in the world when this ended, this program. That meant that the menace was no more. That day has now come. I hope to see all of you around the Poconos soon, happy and healthy. Until then, I'm Chris Barrett. Thanks for watching.